Adalia. During all these days I was reading the Bible in preparation for my book on Palestine. Lying in my bunk at night and upon the deck during the day, I dug deep into the body of that noble volume. The breathing, living poetry of its pages bore me along as upon eagles' wings. My soul gathered sustenance from it as my body from bread. We went on shore again at Adalia. This was an extraordinarily romantic place. It was protected by a high wall of granite-like cliffs over the top at which intervals there fell cascades of tossing water. As we climbed into the boat that was to take us to the small gangway under the town, I noticed the blueness of the sea, bluer than anything I could have imagined, blue as a transparent solid through which it was possible for oars to move. We climbed up to the town by narrow streets. Suddenly from a penthouse a heavy object fell down in front of us. It was a giant lizard, as large as a weasel and of a grey colour bound with black. We stood watching it. It remained quite motionless with its front paws resting upon a doorstep. A ragged boy Turk came round the corner. He saw what we were looking at, and in a second, with the rush of a dog after a rat, he had flung himself towards the creature, stamping at it with his naked foot. The lizard was spry, however, and fled away with its tail on end. The boy picked up a stone and was after it again. With the alacrity of a monster earwig, the lizard darted for a crevice by the side of a gate. The stone crashed against the plastered masonry, sending up a cloud of dust, but the creature had escaped. We learnt afterward that in Turkey such reptiles are regarded with grave suspicion. They are thought to be messages of ill omen. This then accounted for the boy's venomous fury. We now followed the old walls till we came to the cliff's edge, and here we lay under a fig tree. Below us was our steamer, motionless in the bay. Leaving our resting place, we walked along a wide, grass-grown Turkish drove. We passed two women, veiled and dressed in black, who, with the help of long bamboo sticks, were gathering blackberries for their children. At the end of the drove was a stream rushing swiftly in the direction of the sea. How cool and refreshing it looked, bursting up into a spray where its flow was impeded, so white and clean and rapid. The drove led us by an indirect way to the town. Near one of the houses was a backwater of the stream, shallow and stagnant, with the ducks swimming upon it as though in an English village. And I also observed that watercress was growing near its edges. How seldom it is given to us really to escape from the familiar. We can only hope to do so in snatches. The mud in the path leading to the house, dampened by water, spilled from buckets, and the mud on the edge of that pond, this side of the watercress, could if one's mood was disenchanted, wear the very same sottish, unillumined look of all backyard ground, whether in China, Africa or America. The world is obedient to the moods and imaginations of each one of us. We must never forget this. It is we who must redeem each individual leaf of grass, we must see it as it actually is, unclouded by our dull humours. It was midday and we now found ourselves in a very ramshackle part of the town. The sun was hot upon our shoulders. Everywhere bright colours struck against our sight. All at once a loud sound broke the noonday hour. The sound insistent and resonant as a bell. It was the voice of a man. We looked up. And there on a platform encircling the top of a minaret was the muezzin calling Mohammedans to prayer. It was a moment of inspiration. It was impossible not to experience a flash of insight. There against the dome of the firmament, blue and wide and fathomless, stood this living dot. I could see he was bending like a snake, touching his hands first to his temples and then to his loins. Every atom, every electron of that cloudless sky was quivering with sunshine. Here was a display characteristic of no animal. It is not in the nature of ox or ass to raise a head in religious plaint. It was the voice of a man we were hearing, and he was calling into that cerulean void. 
There was once a sanguine astronomer who moved the lens of his telescope across the face of the heavens in the hope that the figure of God would suddenly be revealed upon its shining disk. It is possible that, though God cannot be seen, yet he can see, and in like manner, though he cannot be heard, yet he can hear. Who can say? We are taught that in the infinite economy of nature all sounds are preserved forever. So if there is a God, as many would have us believe, I see no valid reason why the crowing of cocks at dawn, the lowing of stalled beasts, the garden melody of birds in springtime, should not rise up from the planet to his long ears, together with the reiterated chanting of distraught men, at a loss what to make of their consciousness, uncertainly fluttering over an abyss unplumbed and incomprehensible. These Turks hold to their bastard faith with the sulky tenacity of so many pack mules. We have reason to know this, for presently venturing to approach the yard of the mosque we were turned back by two soldiers with fixed bayonets. I tried to explain that I did not wish to enter the building but only to examine its outside. The man with a heavy tanned face of a peasant seemed amused by my chatter, not a word of which he could understand. Thinking that he was growing more friendly, I made as though I were about to advance, at the same time raising my hands to shelter my eyes from the sun so that I might get a better view of the structure. Whether it was this harmless gesture seemed to the boy a demonstration of mockery, or that it offended some custom of which I was ignorant, I could not tell. In a flash, he had raised his bayonet with intent to plunge it into my chitterlings. You may guess it did not take me long to withdraw myself from his scowling, dangerous presence. Away I went bustling up the street, like a dislodged, broody hen, grateful that my skin was still whole, and yet cursing the loutish ignorance of this man, and in truth of all of his compatriots who are so doltish as to imagine that one of their number will some day let fall a messiah into his baggy breeches. During our afternoon wanderings, we came upon a yard where mules and camels were evidently being loaded up for some caravan trek into their interior. Tall dark men with daggers at their hips and with their feet wound round and round with some material like flannel moved about between the animals. They did not seem to resent our presence. Their preparations were in no way romantic to them. Doubtless the task of harnessing camels was but wearisome. I peered through the open door of a shed and saw a bin with a mule standing by it. The dark interior with mule dung on the mud floor and the wood manger looking natural enough. It was only when one's eyes fell on the trappings of the animals that one recognised the difference and was reminded of illustrations in old picture books. The camels awaiting their burdens were of a very small breed. They were covered with funny brown astrakhan hair and had small mouse ears. At each extra bundle put upon them, they twisted round their necks and uttered groans of protest. The extraordinary look of their heads, fitted with long teeth, balanced upon their twisting necks, caused one almost to imagine that these horse sun Turks were making use of a flock of subject dragons for their safari. Later we saw the caravan trooping away toward the distant mountains. Deeply did I envy those traders, their slow advance through the night air. We kept watching them, trailing along, their burdened camels appearing in the distance like fluffed-out turkeys following one behind the other. When they were scarcely outside the walls, they were overtaken by a running man with a huge water gourd. Also a veiled girl hurried out to kiss the hand of a white-bearded miscreant who marched away with step as light as a boy's, never so much as turning his head. The plain that evening pleased me well. It was covered with a kind of heather and thorns and thistles, interspersed with intervals of bare ground, with white bones lying about everywhere. We had on more than one occasion to cross dry riverbeds for all the world like those in Africa. It was climbing out of one of these that I looked back for the last time at those vanishing travellers, who were proposing to move all night long over wet turf in the cool streamside valleys of the far distant Pamphylian Mountains.